There we go. And so Acts chapter 16, the will of God, you ask somebody, what is the will of God? Good morning, John. What is the will of God for your life? And most people are not going to answer because most people have no idea. They have no idea what the will of God is for their life. They have no idea even how to begin looking for it. And a lot of women will say, well, you know, that's not really for me. I mean, I'm married. My husband is the man of the home, the pastor of the home, you know, whatever. And that's not true either. That's not, It's not like women have been disqualified from uh, whatever the will of God is for their life, whether it's in ministry or in other things, raising a family, which is really also a ministry, or owning uh, or operating a business. There's so many things that women uh, can do and that women do uh, in this age. You know, we're not living at the time of Paul 2,000 years ago when um, women were second place, if they had any place at all. We're in a, living in a modern day, and there's lots of things women can do today, but there's also lots of things that women have done in the past and uh, oftentimes caught men uh, by surprise. So we're going to talk about that in Acts chapter 16 because Paul is really surprised at a lot of things that he discovered. Paul, who knew so much about the Bible, actually met the Lord face to face. Um, I'm not going to say that he was so confident in the way that he thought that he knew it all, but he thought, like many of us, that ministry, the Bible, God's will for our life, it all exists in a little kitchen drawer. And it does not. God would be very boring if that's the way that he was. But he thinks outside of the realm. You know, the human brain is just a tiny little thing compared to the mind of God. And so oftentimes he deals with things way outside of our realm, things that we would have never considered Things that we would have never even for a moment thought that we were capable of, maybe because we're not. It's the Holy Spirit that does it, right? So we're going to talk about that in Acts chapter uh, 16. I wanted to first thank uh, Lahana, who is our uh, daughter-in-law. She helps with all of this technical stuff. I wouldn't be able to record this. I wouldn't be able to be on Zoom, do the stuff that we do on social media without uh, uh, the work that God is doing in Lahana's life. And then I want to thank my son for uh, for covering for me last week. They're not with us uh, today because they're at a, a wedding. Somebody in Lahana's family is uh, getting married. Um, it was um, different for me. It was an awakening for me when last week, of course, my wife and I, we were in, in England. They're at a Believers in Recovery uh, retreat. And while my wife or shortly after the Bible study, or before, I forget, but my wife had been sharing with the Believers in Recovery group, and she hardly ever does that, but she was asked. And then uh, Mario Jr. was teaching the Bible study here uh, for me, uh, Saturday, 10 a.m., I think it would have been 6 p.m. Um, in, in England's time, or the UK time. And it's just amazing how one person from the family in this case, Camille, comes to know Jesus Christ personally. And then after that, the whole family comes to know Jesus personally. And then over a period of time, if that family happens to be uh, in the Bible consistently, then what happens is God begins to use not just that person who first came to the Lord, not just the second person, but the whole family in ministry in one way or another. Nobody at least in this family, nobody that I know of is trying to do that. It's just something that uh, that God is doing. And um, and then, of course, you know, I was, man, just blown away at how many people uh, in the, I say UK, I don't even know how to use that uh, correctly, but there's people from Wales, there was people from uh, Ireland, people from Amsterdam, so other parts of Europe that were at this Believers in Recovery uh, retreat. And many of them I have known from years past. I think I first started becoming aware of believers in recovery and and uh, and and participating in that. I think it was 2016. And back then, most of the people that I talked to in believers in recovery, they couldn't get past just their recovery, their 12-step recovery experience. You mentioned a scripture in the Bible, they go immediately to something they heard in the meeting. You talk about becoming mature. 
In scripture, they go immediately to the day and the year that they got clean. And they just couldn't think outside of that realm. When my wife and there were last were there last week, we were at a retreat that was in the way of apologetics. That is how you prove the, the word of God to be uh, true, to be relevant. And in 2016, I can't imagine more than two or three people that would have attended a retreat like that. But there were so many that were there. Why? Because they have grown in their faith. They've grown in their personal relationship with, uh, with Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about just adults. You know, when my wife and I go uh, over there, um, we're hosted by these two gracious people that you see on the screen, Alex and, uh, and Carly. And they have two children. I think Honor is nine and Isaac is 12, soon to be 13. And young Isaac is growing in his faith, in his Bible knowledge, in his, in his school, among his classmates, he talks about the Lord. He talks about things that are going on in the world that aren't biblical. And he leaves these young kids. And when these young kids go home, he leaves these young kids and their parents scratching their head. Who is this kid? What is he talking about? What could he possibly know? You know, when the family comes to Jesus, everybody begins to grow. And so I was just amazed at going back there and seeing how much these people have grown in the word. And not that I'm Mr. Mature in all of these things, but I read my Bible. I study my Bible. I watch people and I could see the difference. So we get saved and immediately there's something different. Everybody knows that, but there's something different when we go, if we're drug addicts and we go from using drugs to getting clean, it's just automatic. Christian maturity is something totally different. That is when the mind becomes transformed. That's when there's a heart transplant. And we're no longer thinking the way we used to think. We're no longer feeling the way that we used to feel. Emotions are secondary. It's all about conviction now. It's all about what the Word of God told us that morning and how He opens doors to apply it. All of these changes um, begin to happen uh, in our lives. The other thing that I noticed when we were there in England is how dark it had become. I can't remember. I think the last time I was there was two years ago or three years ago. From that time to this, I noticed the change. There are people walking around with pentagram necklaces, all dressed in black, weird stuff that they do to their eyes and their face, letting you know that, hey, I am about the kingdom of darkness. I'm not even ashamed of it. And it's just all over the place, similar to what we have here in America. But I see it here every day. I, get, I don't see it in England uh, every day, but I did see it then. And when there's all of this darkness, a group of people, believers in recovery, that are the most Bible-orientated recovery ministry that I know of, and I know of many of them, their light is shining brighter and brighter. In fact, the darker things become around them, the lighter their, uh, the, or the brighter their light becomes. And I'm not saying, I'm not just blowing smoke here. Go with me. I invited so many of you guys to come with me uh, last week when I was there. Many of you didn't come. Maybe next year you will. And it's my hope that uh, believers in recovery would come to America. We'll see what God's doing. I'm not going to, you know me, I'm not going to pressure anybody to do anything that God didn't ask them to do. But I tell you this, if believers in recovery had just a fraction of the impact here in America that it did in England, uh, there's no telling uh, what, might, uh, what might happen. So being there, knowing these people, seeing the changes that God is making in their life, I can really identify with what Paul is saying here in, uh, in, Acts, ch in Acts chapter 16. Because if you remember, if you were with us uh, two weeks ago, Paul, in Acts chapter 14, he had preached to some people and he had taught some people in the area of Derby and Lystra. And now he's going to go back there to do it again. But if you were with us or, or if you're familiar with the chapter, you know that the last time he was there, they didn't tolerate Paul at all, not for a moment. In fact, they drug him outside of the city and they stoned him. Okay, not with drugs. <laughs> they got these rocks and they physically stoned him until they believed he was dead. And then they walked away and left him there. 
If it were Mario, Mario would stay as far away from that place as possible, but not Paul. Paul actually goes back here in Acts chapter 16. And so it's just amazing how when God gifts you and then he uses your life to share the gospel with people, those even those kinds of things don't matter if God has gifted you uh, in that way. And of course, the reason that God does that is because he wants to bring other people, lost people who don't know him, into a relationship with him. And then, of course, he wants to see them grow, which is why Paul continuously goes back to these places. So he typically goes there. He preaches. He teaches the word of God. He'll plant the church. And then he goes to the next town, city, or village, and he does the same thing. But he doesn't leave it like that. He goes back. Because it's one thing to plant the seed. It's one thing to plant the church. It's another thing to water it. And that's what Paul was doing. And so if you're in ministry, these are the kinds of things that you want to remember because we want to emulate uh, these kinds of things. And let me say this. Hear me clearly if you are a leader in ministry. And I know I'm talking to some of you guys here. We don't compete with one another. We are a team. We are a team of uncompromising saints, and the Bible is our authority. I say that because some of you guys know what my relationship is with Pastor Raymond, and I love him to death. I am sure he loves me to the point that if I said, Raymond, I've got a big problem. I need you here. Raymond would fly five hours from the East Coast to the West Coast to see me to say, Mario, what's wrong and how can I help? And I would do the same for him. At the same time, his gifts are different. And so we don't always agree on things, but it's never an issue of eternal salvation, eternal life, or never an issue like that that is core. It's just things on the fringes. And um, so if you find yourself in ministry, as you begin to grow, God uses your life, you're going to meet other people. They're on the same team, even though they may do some things differently. Ooh. Now, I don't partner and I don't claim to be with anybody on a team who is a kind of new age, Buddhism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness. I, they're, in a cat, they're in some other different kind of category. Their ideas are very different from the Bible. Uh, you won't find me in the same room with them doing the same kind of ministry. Not at all. Not even on my worst day. But outside of that, we are a team. And uh, we may not always do things together, but we support each other. Uh, we hold each other up in prayer and all of the things uh, needed. So with that said, get ready. Open up to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to pray and we're going to get uh, started. And I see uh, Marlene with us here. God bless you, Marlene. Always praying for you. My wife and I actually always. And um, you're growing in the Lord. I see it Tuesday nights. So welcome and thank you for joining us. I think it's your first time. My buddy Mike, he can't see you but he could hear you. He's one of the, he's one of the heroes of the faith because uh, he struggles with things that most Christians will never have to struggle with. And you know what? He doesn't struggle. It's all in joy. I've, I've shared him with many of you guys. He's blind and he's an amputee and he could care less. He loves the Lord and he'll serve the Lord wherever he has to go. So thanks for being with us, uh, Mike. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these people, those on Zoom, those who are joining us on Facebook, those who will listen to the message uh, later, I thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives, Lord. Some of us are new. Some of us are seasoned. Some of us are in a place of confusion, trying to figure things out. Others are struggling with what your will is for our life. But Lord, you've given us the Bible, 66 books, all breathed by the Holy Spirit, all given to us freely so that we can study it, we can learn from it, we can apply it, and we can grow in our relationship with you. Father, we say thank you for that. Thank you for our brothers and sisters who work together as a team. We support one another in many ways, Father. You provide, you guide. May it always be the case, Lord. And Father, I pray that Acts chapter 16, at least this first part, that it would speak to us in a way, Father, that would help us to see you, to perceive you in a way that we've never seen before. Thank you, Father, because the study of your word gives us the greatest privilege in all of the history of the world. We get to see into your beautiful mind. 
to see for ourselves how you think. We get to look into your heart to see for ourselves how you feel about certain things. The world will pretend to know that, but the world doesn't know it, Lord. So we pray that you would use each one of our lives to help the world to come to know you, to see you as you are, to be satisfied, to stop chasing after the things of the world and start focusing on you. You, the one who satisfies like a cup of water in a dry desert, Father, like a full meal after several days of not eating at all, you satisfy us that way. Help us if we are looking for you in the way of other things, whether that be finance, uh, relationship, sexual adventures, whatever it is, Father, the, the Satan and the world has a whole host of things that it offers the world to replace you. Help us not to be of that sort, but to be of those totally given to you, Father. Make us stubborn in all of your ways, Father. But make us also open to hearing you and changing directions when you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me tell you that Acts chapter 16, welcome, Stacy. I think it's your first time. Let me tell you that Acts chapter 16, for me, is one of the most eye-opening chapters in the entire Bible. Because in Acts chapter 16, the Lord takes one of his most dedicated... One, Paul is the kind of guy who wore blinders like on a horse. He was not going to look to the right or look to the left. He was not going to go in that direction. He was set. Nothing could stop him. But the Lord says, Paul, this time I need you to hear me, Paul, <laughs> because you are set on going in a direction and then another direction that I never called you to go. And I've got such plans for your life, Paul, and after you come home to be with me, these plans, if you take heed to my word, they're going to affect the entire world for thousands of years, Paul, in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine. So, Paul, don't go east. I know you want to go there. Paul, don't go north. I know you've got your heart set there. Go in the way I'm telling you. And that was Paul's struggle. But the Lord got his attention, and all of us should be eternally thankful that Paul went in that way. Look what it says, Acts chapter 16, verse 1. I'm, I'm excited about this one. It says, Then he, that's Paul, came to Derby and Lystria, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken by the brethren, that is Timothy, who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Well, again, let's not forget in Acts chapter 14, which was just about five years prior to Acts chapter 16, Paul preached and he taught in Derby and Lystria, and they almost killed him for it. All right. Now, Paul goes back and he meets this kid, Timothy. Don't know how old he was, probably a teenager. Um, can't imagine that he was, you know, older than 18 or 19 or 20 years old. But five years have passed since Paul went there and he preached and he taught. Well, he may or may not have known that while he was there the first time, this young kid, probably among all of the adults, was sitting there mm -hmm. listening intuitively to Paul. So much so that he determined at that time to give his whole life to Jesus Christ. Now Paul goes back five years later and he says, wow, look at this kid. Hardly recognized him the first time. Now this kid has become a leader. He's of good reputation with the people. Uh, he's loyal. He's mature. And you know what Proverbs chapter 3 verse 4 says? I would mention this to all of the children represented here. I, I talk to my kids about it all the time. It says that with God's commands in our hearts and loyalty and kindness, the practice of those things, we find favor, it says, with both God and people and, you ready, 
we earn a good reputation. Maybe not at first, but as life begins to play out uh, in, 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 in people, they begin to see, wow, what Les told me, what Stella said 10 years ago, I still remember it, and it makes so much sense now. can hardly believe it. So, you know, you're not going to get a pat on the back, hardly ever, and especially in the beginning, but over a period of time. So we find here in Acts chapter 16 that it's time for Timothy to go to the next level, and he is about to get some training in ministry, and God is going to use Paul to train him. Let me just mute somebody here. There we go. So notice in verse 3, this is kind of strange for Paul, who has blinders on, who is uncompromising. Look at verse 3. It says that Paul took Timothy and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Well, if you remember, in Acts chapter 15, two weeks ago, Paul was unhinged. He was angry. He was volatile. And he was uncompromising when the Jews began to say that if Gentiles came into a relationship with the Lord, if they wanted to enter into the family of God, they had to be circumcised first and they had to acknowledge the law of Moses prior to doing that. And Paul said, no way, not on my life. You and I can't even do that. How are we going to ask Gentiles to do it? You big bag of hypocrites, we ain't going to do it. Now here, Paul says that he had to circumcise Timothy because, and then he gives us these reasons. So we ask ourselves, is Paul compromising here? Have five years changed him to the point that he's beginning to compromise his principles, his theology? Not at all. Not at all. He did it because where he was going, there was going to be religious new Jews who knew Timothy and who knew his parents. Timothy came from what we call today a mixed marriage. He had a Jewish mother, but he had a Greek father. This, of course according to the law of Moses, would have been an offense to any good Jew. And so if it had not been obvious that Timothy was leaning towards his Jewish heritage rather than Greek heritage, the Jews in the city would have immediately rejected Paul and his message. No doubt about it. You know, they would have just immediately not even heard the first few words. Paul knew this. So he says, you know what, Timothy, it's not necessary but because of where we're going, the best thing to do to reach these people is to make sure that they know that you are more Jew uh, than Greek. So Paul wasn't compromising theology, but at the same time, he wasn't going there to debate all kinds of religious traditions. And he was removing what would have been irrelevant issues that would become obstacles to sinners coming into a relationship of the grace of Jesus Christ. It's all he was doing. Does Paul want to do that in your life and in my life? <clears throat> Listen, I have a couple of people on with us here and on Facebook that are very rigid in their faith, in their relationship with Christ, and in, in their theology, and I admire that 100%. Some of you guys are very strong. I'm looking at my buddy Alex there. I know him very well. He loves the Lord, and he is an un compromising soldier in ministry as I am, as John Mendoza, who's with us on, on, on Facebook. But you know, here's where we got to hit the brakes and consider some things. We People like us, we don't like that. We don't like, it's uncomfortable to be that open. We feel like we're compromising our loyalty to God and to the gospel. But look at what Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians. I think Camille's putting these scriptures on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23, Paul says, Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. I don't even like that word slave when it comes to people. I'll be a slave for the Lord. I don't know about people. But Paul says, no, I'm a slave to people because I'm a slave to the Lord. He says, when I was with the Jews, now he explains, I lived like a Jew to bring Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. 
even though I am not subject to that law. I did this. Why, Paul? Tell us why. So I could bring to Christ those who are under the law, that burden of the law. When I am with Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law. Why? So I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. I take all of those laws that, uh, that God laid out through Moses in the Old Testament, Paul says. But he says, I obey the law of Christ, which is what? Two. Love the Lord God Almighty with all of my mind, with all of my strength, with all of my heart, and love my neighbor as myself. The, Jesus said if we do those two things, we obey all of the law, right? But look at verse 22. When I am with those who are weak, we're talking about people who are just babies in Christ. Okay, they're not, they're, they don't have much maturity in Christ. And listen, that has nothing to do with how long they've been in Christ. I have met people who have been walking with Christ five years, 10 years, 50, 20 years. They wear the cross. They have the t-shirt. They have the bumper sticker. They know John 3, 16, but they've never come to maturity. And all you got to do is hear them talk. And you see the way that they think. You can hear them talking in a way that you say, I don't understand how you don't have any kind of Holy Spirit conviction in the things that you're saying. I don't understand the ideas. What's going on? They're immature in the faith. They are these weaker people that Paul is talking about. Verse 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 again. Paul said, when I am with those who are weak, those that I just described, I share their weakness. Why? Because Paul said, I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can. Why? To save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. You know, before I went to England, just a couple of days before, I have this longtime friend of mine. He's 80 or 81 or 82 years old. So I have known this guy for 42 years. And he's a very strong mind. He's an old school guy, big, tough guy, Mexican-American guy from East Los Angeles, grew up in the projects, guy from Maravilla, drug addict, of course, the whole thing. And I was talking to him uh, on the phone, and he has cancer now. And I just told him, I said, listen, uh, you know, you need Jesus Christ, man. You know me. I've been talking to you about it from time to time. And this was very uncomfortable for me. I've known him a long time, tough guy and all that. Do you know that after our conversation, about 15 minutes had passed and he had asked Jesus Christ into his life. Now, you know, there are a lot of people that do that and they've done it 15 or 20 times and it doesn't really mean anything. This guy is a kind of guy. He has never done that before in his life. Not in prison, not out of prison. Um, and if anybody would have offered him that, he would have immediately told them where to go. That's the way this guy is. So when people like that with their mouth, confess Christ, you know that they're believing in their heart. So I told them, look, I'm going to go to England for about 10 days. When I come back, I'm going to pick you up. We're going to go to dinner, just you and I, and we're going to go to church. No, I don't think he's ready for that. I don't think he would go. I said, we're going to go to a meeting together. And you know what? I'll tell you, when I go with them to the meeting, I'm going to sit in my chair. It, it's my home group. They go around this big circle and everybody has to say, my name is so-and-so and I'm an addict. Do you think I'm going to sit in that chair and say, my name is Mario and I'm an addict? You better believe I'm going to do that. And is it because I believe that? Absolutely not. No way do I believe. It. My identity is not in the things of my past. It's not the, this identity of a 12-step program, my identity is in Jesus Christ, the way the Bible says that it is. I don't know much more than that. So why am I going to do that? Because I'm compromising my theology? Not at all. It's what Paul said. I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I will try to find common ground with everyone doing everything that I can do to save some. That's what I'm going to do. Alex is on his way out. I think they gave him two years to live, and I think he's gone past that. Uh, I said his name. I wasn't going to say his name, but I said his name. Anyway, 
Uh, that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to call him and I'm going to stay in contact with him. But one thing he knows for sure that at this point, when he takes his last breath, he is going home to be with the Lord. It doesn't matter what he spent the last 80 years doing. It is water under the bridge. It'll all be washed away. And it's not because he knows his theology. He will probably be like the thief that was crucified next to Jesus on the cross. He didn't understand the theology of salvation and all of these different things. He just confessed with his mouth and believed in his heart. Look at verse 6, Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It's getting exciting now. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go on into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas, which is a coastal region there. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. It was a man of Macedonia who stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately... We sought, that is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, we sought to go to Macedonia, Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. You know, when I was young, maybe like some of you, I was very unstable. I was young in the Lord, but also when I came to the Lord and I was new to the Lord, I was very unstable. I was easily persuaded to do anything. That's why I started using heroin. I was so impressionable and uh, I was easily persuaded and I didn't have direction. So, hey, you know, anything would work. Um, the other thing is I couldn't stay with a person for too long at all. Uh, heroin kind of put an end to any relationship that I ever had. But prior to that, I didn't stick around with one person or a group of people very long, no matter what loyalty I might have pledged. It just it lasted for a season and then I, I was gone. So when I got saved, when I came to Christ, I was really impressed with those strong, um, consistent, I'll say immovable uh, Christian leaders that I met along the way. Pastor Chuck Smith, uh, who had been. Uh, for more than 50 years, actually, in the same city, behind the same pulpit, never moved from there. He knew what his gifts were, and he stayed there. And now there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world that have gotten saved through that ministry that God gave him. I think about Billy Graham, 60 years evangelizing uh, around the world. I would have got tired and said, you know, honey, I'm done. I'm staying home. I'm not going out anymore. I've done my piece. He didn't do that. Those were the gifts that God gave him, and he continued to do that. And I think about Paul, the, the, the apostle Paul here, always planting, watering, cultivating, overseeing the churches that he planted, even while facing prison, persecution, and even death. And I admire that. And that is to be admired. Somebody that strong in the faith, immovable in the way of ministry, it is to be uh, uh, admired. Um, but we also have to be open when the Lord changes our direction. So let me just offer you some of my uh, experience. Take it for whatever it, it's worth. But there have been times that God has spoken to me. Uh, sometimes through visions and dreams. It's rare. It's very rare. But he has given me those things. And I can tell you that when you come to that place, it can be very tricky. Uh, that I can recall, I, I think it was only two or three dreams in 23, 24 years, whatever it's been, that I've been walking with the Lord. Uh, once or twice a vision during the broad daylight, in the middle of the afternoon, I'm driving down a busy Los Angeles street. And between me and the front windshield, a scroll rolled open, and God showed me a picture on that scroll. It didn't block my view or anything. I kept driving, but God showed me uh, that the picture on that scroll. And I knew, because God had already been speaking to me about those things in many different ways, mostly in His Word. And I knew what He was saying. Um, recently, uh, in the last year, I think, uh, somebody else had a dream uh, regarding uh, my future, 
Now, thank God for my pastor, Pastor Raul, because he taught us well. I don't just get all hyped up in emotions and run uh, with that. Uh, somebody said that the volume is a little bit lower. Maybe that'll help. I don't just take that vision or that dream that I have or somebody else and just run and get all emotional uh, with those things. A lot of people can do that. I know myself, okay? I'm very clear about who I am and I can run away with lots of craziness. I don't do that. What I do is first I consider the vision or the dream if it was a dream, mostly when they're repetitive. That's when I start to pay attention and I've had that happen to me. And then what I do is I begin to compare where I'm at uh, presently and, and, you know, physically, uh, spiritually, financially, very important, relationally. Uh, I consider the gifts that God has uh, given me. You know, if God were to say, Mario, uh, there's a circus in town. I want you to join the circus because I'm going to use you in that circus to evangelize as they travel. I have no experience on the trapeze. I don't train elephants. I that, you know, it's probably something I ate before I went to bed, right? I'm not paying attention to anything uh, like that. But there are other things that we need to, to, to pay attention to. So we do all of that. And then the most important thing, and if you don't know the word, if you're not in the word every day, you really can't do this. But the most important thing is to take all of that and weigh it or measure it against the word of God. Then what you do is you wait. Well, how long do you wait? I know how impatient some of you are. I'm probably more impatient than all of you. Sometimes the waiting is a long time. Sometimes it's years. What you will find, though, if you're really paying attention, is within that span of time, God is introducing you to people. You may have known them before, but now you really get to know them. You may have never met them before, but you met them and... They're pouring all of these new things into your life. There's just all of this added revelation. And you're comparing that with a word and your experience. And then God opens the door and you say, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Here it is. This is actually God speaking to me. This is actually God opening the door. So uh, call me stupid, call me crazy, but I actually believe with all of my heart in Isaiah 55, verse 8, where God says, my thoughts, Mario, they're not your thoughts. My ways, Mario, they're not your ways, Mario. Get this, understand this, Mario. As far as the heavens are from the earth, that's how different my thoughts are. That's how different my ways are from your ways, Mario. You have a little tiny brain. I know that you think you're so smart. I've been, I've sat with you while you've read through the Bible and these other books. You know so much, but Mario, you are so limited and you've got to understand that. And your emotions drive you crazy, Mario, but you've got to understand your ways are not my ways. And so I realize that what God wants to do in my life is usually much bigger and much more different than whatever I had in mind. Why do I say that? Well, because if you happen to have a 2,000-year-old map, all right, showing Asia, Asia Minor and, and Europe, or if you've been with us on one of our trips to, to Turkey and Greece and Rome, then you know, then you can see that the plan that God had for Paul's life was so much bigger and far more different than even Paul could have imagined. Now, Paul had a lot of experience. He's, he saw Jesus face to face, didn't he? He had all of this experience with the Lord. He not only knew the Bible, he wrote the Bible. His hand wrote what God specifically told him to write. And Paul, in many ways, was very close-minded in things that he learned from his Jewish upbringing, including his position on women. Don't you know that? Isn't he the one that said that women shouldn't teach men? And listen, I was very proud of my wife in England. Because if you notice what she shared 
was almost all her testimony. Okay, She didn't open up the word and start breaking down scriptures and getting into the Greek and getting into the Hebrew because of her personal conviction that women shouldn't teach men. That's why she almost didn't go with me to do that. Um, but she went and she did that. And I, I think people responded. Well, she got a lot of text messages and some of the women have been talking to her and things like that. So God used that, of course. You know, let me just say this. The Bible talks very clearly about the fact that women should not teach men. They are the weaker vessel. Is that true? If you know the Bible, you know full well that's true. If you go to the book of Genesis, who did Satan approach? Did he approach Adam? No. He approached the weaker vessel, the Bible says, who was Eve. Why did he do that? Because he knew his chances for deceiving the world would be much better with a woman who is the weaker vessel, God said, than it would have been the man. So men are not more important. They're not more meaningful than women. But as God created us, they are the weaker vessel. And let me just, I'm going to be bold. Homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, they want to change all of that. You cannot change God's word. You cannot change the truth. You can try. You can call the truth a lie and you can call the lie a truth. But God's word is going to stand. So women are the weaker vessel. We might like that. We may not like that. But that's the fact. That's what God says. So my wife went, but she shared her testimony more than she did teaching. And, and I admire that. And, and I know why. It's because she knows the Bible. So she was very careful. She respects God. She fears God. She loves God. Um, so Paul is going to run into something very different when he finally realizes, no, Paul, it's not the direction you want for your life it's the direction the lord wants for your life and when you get to the place i'm calling you you're going to be very surprised at what i'm doing with a woman there paul you're going to see but imagine for now all right so if you had a map or if you've been with us you understand the area of galatia and where that was at two thousand years ago there's no place called galatia today but that area all right and if Paul had gone from that area of Galatia to the east towards Asia, or if he had gone north to Bithynia, then you know that the gospel, as it has come to America and to England, would have gone to Russia and China in the same way. It did not. It did not. The gospel, because of the direction God called Paul to go when Paul didn't want to go that way, ended up coming to England and then later on to America. Imagine just for a minute, put the Bible aside, just imagine for a moment what the outcome would have been if Paul would have gone his way to Asia or to that northern area where Russia is at. Imagine. Think about how our governments, I don't think there's anybody with us from Sweden today, but you guys that are in England, of course, you, you guys that are in America, imagine, think about how our governments and our culture have been shaped by the gospel. I know we live in a dark place today, but it hasn't always been that way. Think about that. Christian kings and queens in England, the decisions that they made because of their biblical convictions. Martin Luther and the Reformation, uh, the King James Bible, and the freedom that we gain through that Reformation to possess one. What would you and I know if the Bibles had been kept from us? What would we possibly know? Nothing. It would all be guesswork. And then, of course, later on down the, down the, down the road, and I'm so grateful. You know, I don't know if I shared it when I was there, but in my heart, I have a very, I love Lots of people. But in my heart, I have a very special place for Jews and people from England. Because, not because really the ones today, but your ancestors in the past. They put it all on the line. So somebody like Mario could know Jesus Christ. Imagine that. Do you? So I, I'm what they say, Mexican-American. I don't feel that way. I'm an American first and foremost. But they say that because my heritage. If you consider my heritage, you know what my people were doing 500 years ago? They were wearing grass skirts. 
They were carrying spears and worshiping a snake in the jungles of Mexico. They would have war with one another. They would rip open each other's chest with a dagger and pull hearts out and eat them. That's what they were doing. Check it out. Mayans, Toltecs, Aztecs, this is the way that they live. Great warriors, maybe, but they didn't know a thing about the truth. Then the Puritans came from England. And then lots of ministers and evangelists and great theologians came from England. And they said, that's not the way to go. This is what we call the Bible. This was given to us by the one and only true God. Really? Nobody told me. And now we are a Christian nation. Barack Obama said we're no longer a Christian nation. I'm hoping that we still are. We'll see. But then <clears throat> what did we do in the United States? We formed the Constitution. And where did we get the idea for the Constitution? From the Bible. Down the road for you guys that are in 12-step recovery. You were using drugs because you were stupid. Can I say that? Because I was stupid. Right? And then we were enlightened by a group of people that said, hey, you don't have to live that anywhere anymore. You don't have to live like that anymore. Really? Why not? Well, because we have a group of people that are not, used to be like that. We're not anymore. And we have these 12 steps. What are the 12 steps? Well, we got those from the Bible. No. Yes. Look at the history. So in so many ways, the Bible being presented to us first by the Jews, then by the wonderful people in England, we in America have become a Christian nation and all the better for it. We treat our women as equal, right? Just like they do in England. Now, let me ask you a question. Is Russia that way? Is China that way? Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, India, are any of those that way? Absolutely not. Listen, what Paul did, because he was obedient to the Lord, he was open-minded just enough. Paul could have never imagined for a moment the magnitude of his ministry and the things that God had in mind for the future of the gospel. And we too cannot pretend to know or imagine how God will use our life and how we might impact people today and in the future. You say, oh yeah, with my children. No, more than that. More than that. You know, I tell you, I, not that this may amount to anything, may not amount to, to anything, I don't know. But one of the things Lahana is doing is all of the messages that we do are recorded. And of course, you know, our goal at the Spirit Connection is to go from Genesis all the way to Revelation, have it recorded, have it all my notes, all documented, because somebody in the future might, maybe they'll be in recovery, maybe not. They're going to say, man, I'm desperate. I mean, I want to know. I'm tired of playing the God of my understanding. I want to know what is God. And somebody, some young kid, maybe Isaac, you see, you know, when I was a kid, my dad and my mom, they had a friend. It was this guy. He was from America. And I, I'd never been to America, but I knew because he used to come to our house. He has these recordings. You should listen to these recordings. And who knows that somebody might get saved and somebody after, after I'm 200 years dead. You know what happened when we went to England? The retreat, let me see if I have time. I got a little bit of time. The retreat was in a place called, we call it Melvern. They call it something in the English, uh, I don't know, but it's Melvern. And that's where the retreat was had. And so after my wife shared, we decided to go for a walk. Just England is beautiful. If you've never been there, and if you're from California, you can't even imagine the water, the greenery, the history. It, it, it's an amazing place. My wife and I went on this little enchanted trail, man, trees and flowers and little trails. And there was this old church, probably, that I think the church was probably older than America. If I had to guess, a lot of the churches there are. And those little churches have a graveyard. And so we were walking, and then here comes this little old lady with a cane, and she said in her accent, you know, who are we and where are we going? I said, oh, we want to see the church. Oh, she said, well, you know, come on in, make yourself at home, blah, blah, blah. And then we were walking through the graveyard, and she said that this guy named Peter Mark Rogette, or Roger, I don't know how to pronounce is buried there. I said, and who is he? 
And then she said he was the, th the creator of the thesaurus. Now, it's very difficult to understand in the English accent, the thesaurus. I had to ask her about four times. But then she explained the thesaurus. I said, oh, my God. Now, I would have never cared for the thesaurus because I didn't like school and I didn't read books, right? Do now. And I use the thesaurus all the time. I said, you got to be kidding. She said, no, right there. Which one? And she showed me, and Camille and I walked over there, took a picture of the grave marker. And I said, wow, this guy had no idea that the work that he would do, if you know what the sort, that is a big, but he took every single word in the English uh, language and gave us the meaning. I, I would imagine he and probably his wife said, you know, you're wasting your time. Let's go out for lunch. Let's live life. He said, no, I feel a calling to do this. And I'll bet, I don't know this for a fact, but I'll bet he was a Christian. Most people from England at that time were. And he did that. And how many great theologians, pastors, evangelists, people that, uh, you know, work in the field of ministry, how many of them have used the thesaurus? I use it all the time. Well, listen, not only, and don't be afraid, we're not going to try to get through the whole chapter today. But not only was this area of Macedonia completely opposite of the direction, and it's hard to explain, but where Paul was at was in Asia Minor. So to the north, it wouldn't be called Russia. It would have been called Bithynia back then, was Bithynia. To the east was, uh, um, I forget the name of all of these places, but in, in Asia Minor, if he would have gone east, he would have been going towards China. That's where Paul was at. And then he ends up at Troas, which was, at, it was a sea town. So it was on the Mediterranean or the uh, Asian Sea. If you went with us on the trip in April, we didn't take that cruise through the Mediterranean. We went through the Asian Sea. It's, it's kind of branched off from there. That's exactly the route that Paul took to go to Macedonia, which today would be kind of northern Greece in that direction. This was entirely opposite of what Paul had in mind, where his direction were con was concerned. But when he arrived, the situation was far more different than what Paul expected. Also, look at verse 11 and pay attention. Let's see if you can pick it up before we get to my notes. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to ne Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, letter to the Philippians which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. So it's a Roman colony, all right? And we were staying in that city for some days. Paul was probably thinking, did I make a mistake? Am I, was I hallucinating when I had that vision, right? Some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside. Interesting. Paul never did that before where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women. Whoa, who met there? Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. You went with us in April. We went to that city who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. If you are familiar with the 13 or 14 letters that Paul wrote in the Bible, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, then you know that so many of these things in these uh, four verses were very contrary to Paul's ministry and his way of life, his theology and what he agreed or what he would have agreed on. Um, first of all, when he got to this city, there was no synagogue. That's where Paul would have went first. As you read all of his travels, he always went to the synagogue first because that's where the Jews would gather and that's where he would present the gospel to the Jews. But here in verse 13, very strange, Paul went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. Why is that? Because there was no synagogue. 
Why wasn't there a synagogue in this place? Because there was less than 10 Jews who lived there. If there would have been 10 Jewish men, they would have built a synagogue. It was not the case. So also, if you caught this, in Paul's vision, in verse 9, look at it again. He had a vision of a man of Macedonia calling, saying, come over here and help us. Who did he meet when he got there after he spent several days? Not a man. He met a woman named Lydia. This would have caught Paul completely off guard, right? And she's not just a woman. In those days, you know, a woman would have just been second class, third class, maybe, whatever. There's not a lot of regard for women in those days. Roman culture, Grecian culture, all of those things. Uh, so she wasn't just a woman, but she was a leader of a woman. Pay attention, ladies. She was a leader. Look what it says. It says that she was a seller of purple. If you went with us on the trip, purple was very expensive. Remember how we learned how they used to make it? They used to get these sea snails and these shellfish and then mix up a concoction and wait and then mix it again and do all of these things. And it was only super wealthy people that had uh, uh, purple colored clothing or royalty that had purple colored clothing. And so Lydia dealt in what was very expensive back then, all right? And she was a seller of purple, so wealthy businesswoman for sure. And then look at verse 15. When she and her house, I don't know where Mr. Lydia was. Maybe there wasn't a Mr. Lydia. Maybe he died, divorced, I don't know. But it says when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Why was she able to persuade Saul? Because God had been speaking to him and because Lydia was a salesperson. All right. The best salesperson, as you know, can sell an ice cube to an Eskimo, as they say. Right. And so listen, she was a leader and she was the influencer in her home. How do you like that? You know, last night. Because my wife, she sacrificed. To me, my birthday is not a big deal at all. I got mad at my wife when we first met because she had me a surprise party. And there were all of these people there. And I pulled her aside. I said, don't ever do this to me again. <laughs> when it comes to my wife's birthday, there better be a parade. There better be something. You know, <laughs> actually not that bad. But she likes to be celebrated on her birthday. And so she sacrificed that to go to England. And we did something special. Alex, Carly, and the kids and myself, we did something special for her birthday. And they also at the at the retreat, they did they sang her happy birthday and stuff like that. But when we got home, the kids know. So yesterday, uh, Mario and Lahana took us out to dinner, and Priscilla and uh, and Jordan, and of course the grandbabies came and we celebrated her birthday. And my son Mario prayed before we ate. And he said something, and I'm still not sure if I was surprised or just outright offended. <laughs> but he thanked God because he said that his mother was the glue that held the family together. Well, I thought I was until I remembered the fool that I had been for the first, uh, I don't know, 15 years or whatever it was of our marriage. And my kids remember that. Now, thank God that he's changed me quite a bit, but I can't imagine my family trusting me at all in those days. To give them some money? Yeah, probably. But outside of that, who knows where dad might be? And, and Camille prayed so many times desperately late in the evenings, not knowing where I would was at, but imagining. And then, uh, you know, it, it, it was a mess. So what happened is my wife gave her life back to the Lord. She recommitted her life. She prayed and uh, read her Bible and took the kids to a Bible teaching, not just a church, a Bible teaching church. And they began to grow. And dad stayed stuck on stupid. But over a period of time, dad joined them. What began all of that? A mother a wife, a woman who took the reins of leadership because the husband failed to do it. I thought a leader was something else back then. I was so wrong. But she knew better. 
And God confirmed that in her life. And so now God uses my tattered old life and the life of my children. And of course, uh, Camille's life. This is the kind of woman that Lydia was. And listen, you know what Paul said. I told you in the beginning, women should not teach men. And then he said that in the church, women should be silent. If you have a question, ask your husband when you get home, Paul said, right? Now, I don't know if that's because women in the middle of the service say, hey, honey, you know, the Jewish men and the Jewish women sat in separate sides. Hey, honey, what did the pastor mean by that? <laughs> I don't know if that's why Paul said that or not, but that's what Paul said. So uh, how surprised do you think Paul was when he was there first looking for a synagogue and the Jews couldn't find any? And then looking for a man who he saw in the vision, but it was a woman named Lydia. And then when you get to verse 40, we'll get there next week. The church in this area was in Lydia's home. I don't know if she taught in that church. I don't know if she preached in that church, but she was the leader. It was in her house. It was her way. She was a strong businesswoman. She could persuade people, even men. If she could persuade Paul, she could probably persuade any woman. And so this was not something that Paul was used to seeing. So this expanded Paul's mind uh, in many different ways. He learned to listen to God in a whole new way. He learned flexibility, which is very difficult for me. You know what I've noticed over the years? I, I had to go to anger management years ago surprise surprise right it was either that or go to jail I, I took the anger management class and in anger management i learned so much and i hated the guy in fact i threw the paper on his desk and he looked at me and he said who are you and what is this i said read it you know what it says i was angry in anger management class right and uh, i said read the paper you know what it is and he handed me back the paper he said you don't have to be here you can go to jail oh i changed my attitude I said, sorry about that. I said, you have to sign that and I have to come to your class. All right. I learned so much in that class. You know what he did? I was one of the, I was kind of big at that time. I used to work out in the whole thing. And then there was this little short skinny guy. He pulled us one exercise. He, he pulled us to the front of the class. And he asked us how we would move this big file cabinet. And he said, Mario, you go first. And I looked at it and I said, I'll pick it up and carry it wherever you need it to go. And he said, I thought you would answer that way. He said, how about you, sir? And he told the little skinny guy. And he said, well, it looks to be pretty heavy. I would probably get a dolly or something else and try to get wheels under it. That way I could roll it. To... And the guy said, sit down. He said, you made my point. Big, strong, rigid, tough guy men who happen to be the most sensitive, they're going to do everything according to their mindset and their brute strength. The little guy and the woman they're going to think things through more practically. That's just human nature. Paul was a little guy, history set, tells us. But he was so set in his ways. And God had to kind of chisel that away. And he did it using a woman. How do you like that? How do you like that, Alex? <laughs> so God cracks me up, man. You know, nobody can convince me. I would have thought of it to be an abomination before. But today, nobody can convince me that God does not have a sense of humor. He has a sense of humor. And he loves us. And he jokingly teaches us lessons and things like that. So with this first part of Acts chapter 16, I think the message is that any Christian man or woman has to study the word, consider what God is telling you, and of course, be steady about all of those things, but be open to his direction. And what we'll find is just like Paul, God will blow our minds, man. Um, so, you know, I've been walking with the Lord for a while. Uh, not as long as my pastor and some other people. But I know that if I live to be 85 years old, he is still not done. He's still going to be doing things. He's still going to be teaching me. He's still going to be using my, my life in ways that I can't imagine. And so God likes to make things fun, but it requires our uh, cooperation. We cannot be God. We cannot 
consider ourselves to be smarter or in any way knowing more than God. That is a completely ridiculous idea. And so if you are of the mind that you're going to create the God of your own understanding, you're going all the way back to your mindset, being very simple, using that little tiny brain that God gave you to determine what he wants to do in your life. You're not going to get very far. You'll be dissatisfied, discontent. Uh, but if we trust him, wow, uh, what he might do. Listen, not only in our lifetime, in the future, who knows? Certainly with our children, if we have children. I see Jack. I know he's teaching his granddaughters things about the Lord every chance he gets. And he'll do it till the day he takes his last breath. I know the man. And uh, I, I think about Aaron and Lynette doing the same thing. Aaron is a prayer warrior. And he's praying for his kids and things are happening with them. And of course, Alex and Carly and the, the whole bunch of you guys. So uh, let's continue on. And let's see what the Lord will do. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, you teach us. The Bible teaches us things that we could not possibly know outside of the Bible. And you do that in the way that you do that because you are our loving, doting father. And just like with our children, our grandchildren, nobody, no matter how many times they fail, we're still so proud of them. We still laugh at their mistakes. Oh, we discipline them. If, we're, if, if we are worth our weight in salt as parents and grandparents, we discipline them. But it's not for a lack of love. It's because we love them so much. And Lord, we learned that from you. So we just want to say thank you for loving us. Thank you for the privilege of using our lives. And Father, I pray for each one of us here, that you would continue to shape us, mold us, break us when we need breaking so that we can consider you and not so much ourselves and then have the future that you've intended for us. Be with all of us here, Father. Remember all of the needs represented here. Some need healing. Some need uh, uh, healing in their relationships. Others, physical healing. We definitely need to be more committed to studying, reading your word, and to have the courage to go forward and share the gospel that you might be glorified. Not the world, not ourselves, not any group of people, but that you would be glorified. Thank you, Father, for this day and another opportunity to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to end this on Facebook. Thanks, you guys, for, for, for joining us. Paul and John and Roberta and the rest of you, God bless you. Hope to see you next week. And let me turn off the recording.